Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Creation Myths. Uh, this one's going to be kind of fun. This is going to be a quick uh, pre buttle of a video uh, that is going to go live tomorrow as I record this. I'm actually recording this uh, on November 27th, 2025. Uh, it's actually Thanksgiving, and the rest of my house is asleep. So, what am I doing? I'm rebutting creationists. But this time, I'm actually pre butting the creationist arguments that we will hear in the future, because what I'm going to do is address this video right here before it premieres. This video, as I record this, is premiering tomorrow, and what I'm doing here is preemptively addressing the misinformation that you're going to hear in that video, if you can stand to watch it, from Rawmat. Yes, that Rawmat, the amateur YouTube creationist who once thought you could get all of the nutrition you need from breathing and didn't need to eat food. That guy. So what we're going to talk about here for a few minutes is the misinformation that Raw Matt is going to spout in this premiere. And it's great because that video is pre-recorded, so they can't change anything in response to what I say here, which is fun. So first, let me say that I'm doing this not because Raw Matt is like particularly notable or influential in the young earth creationist world, but because he's going to be hawking the same arguments that professionals like Dr. Nathaniel Jensen with his Harvard PhD are making. And I'm going to tell you how to briefly refute those arguments. So let's just get right into it. Here is what Rawmat is going to say. He's going to say something like this. Directly observed mutation rates based on pedigrees with no evolutionary assumptions prove that mitochondrial Eve, the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, existed just 6,000 years ago. And these mutation rates will say something like mitochondrial mutation rates are fast. And he may even say something completely bananas like if the evolutionists are right about their time frames, then we should, should have seen like tens of thousands of mutations. I forget what number he says, but it's like some giant number of mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, completely uh, not realizing that the mitochondrial DNA is only 16,000 bases long, give or take. So you can't have like 20,000 mutations in the mitochondrial DNA uh, because there's only so many sites you can mutate. But that's beyond the point. Uh, what he's going to say is that evolutionists have to rely on evolutionary assumptions, like a human chimp, most recent common ancestor, approximately six to eight million years ago. And then if you assume that that common ancestor existed, if you assume human evolution, then you can use that as kind of the basis for your calculations for the mitochondrial mutation rate, and that gets you an old age for mitochondrial Eve. So that's going to be the gist of his argument. Directly observed mitochondrial mutation rates prove that mitochondrial Eve was 6,000 years ago, yada, 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 therefore young earth. That's going to be the central argument. So let's talk about why it's wrong. The big thing here is that he's using a single generation mutation rate, uh, which is the rate at which mutations occur as the substitution rate which is the rate at which mutations achieve fixation, or you can think about it as the rate at which mutations accumulate in a population. So he's taking that one generation rate from parent to offspring, you have this many mutations, and we're going to extrapolate that rate backwards infinitely until we reach the number of mutations that separate the two most divergent humans on Earth in terms of their mitochondrial DNA, which is like 120-ish mutations. So how many generations would that take? And then given an average generation time of whatever years, how many years would that take, right? Those are uh, how we're arriving at those numbers. Now, raw mat is not doing that, right? Uh, this is coming from Nathaniel Jensen. And Dr. Nathaniel Jensen admitted to me directly when I talked to him a few years ago that that's what he's doing. And raw mat is just cribbing from Jensen, right? That calculation is wrong, and it invalidates everything he's saying. And the reason it's wrong is that it requires the mitochondrial DNA to be experiencing no purifying selection. That is, no selection, zero selection against new mutations that occur. And this is not a serious claim. 
that there's no selection operating, there's no purifying selection operating on the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is extremely consistent across all of the sequenced human mitochondrial genomes that we have. Like, do we really think that over half of the mitochondrial DNA, something like 80%, according to a legitimate paper, an actual real paper by Dr. Rob Carter from Creation Ministries International, all of that mitochondrial DNA is just magically immune to mutations, and that's why it's consistent, it's the same in every human that we've ever sequenced? Or do those mutations get selected out because the mitochondrial DNA is extremely gene-dense and does extremely important things, so messing with it causes problems? It should be pretty obvious that we see very little variation in the mitochondrial DNA because when you mess with it, bad things happen. Now, on top of that, we have the DNDS ratio, the ratio of the rate of non-synonymous mutations, mutations that change the amino acid sequence, to synonymous mutations, mutations that don't change it. That ratio is super low in the mitochondrial DNA, meaning we see way more mutations that don't change the proteins compared to the mutations that do. This is extremely strong evidence of purifying selection. It's just dead to rights proof, as much as you can get proof in biology, that the mitochondrial DNA experiences very strong purifying selection. And that slows down the rate at which mutations accumulate, which means the mutation rate doesn't equal the substitution rate, which means the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor, mitochondrial Eve, existed in the way more distant past than young Earth creationists can accommodate. We're talking like 100 to 200,000 years ago rather than 6,000 years ago. That's the single biggest flaw in the creationist arguments having to do with mitochondrial mutation rates, but it's not the only one, so let's talk about a couple of the others. Raw mat is also cherry-picking single-generation pedigree mutation rates, citing studies like uh, Parsons, is one he likes, which I think is from 1997. A Ding 2015 is another one. That's the one that uh, Nathaniel Jensen used in his most well-known work on this, writing for Answers in Genesis. And I'll tell you, Romat just loves that Parson paper, and he'll probably say something about how the FBI uses that rate, so it must be right. What Romat won't talk about is how multi-generation pedigrees with a known common ancestor but instead of being just one generation, we're talking two, three, four, five generations in the past, or lines of descent from a known historical event, like a migration event, completely blow up his calculation. For uh, some examples of what I'm talking about here, you can look at the settlement of the island of Tristan de Cunha in the Atlantic Ocean. That island had no permanent settlement until 1816, but we know exactly when it was finally permanently settled, in 1816. So you can look at the lineage of those original settlers and see the mitochondrial mutation accumulation rate. And wouldn't you know it, it's consistent with the ancient date for the mitochondrial most recent common ancestor. You can do the same thing by looking at the female lineage for the family of King Richard III, starting with his sister, Anne of York, who died in 1476. And you can look using King Richard III's mitochondrial DNA, because we've identified his skeleton and sequenced the mitochondrial DNA, we can then look at Anne of York's lines of descent and identify two individuals in the modern world who are strictly female line of descent and look at the mutations in those mitochondrial genomes. And the same thing is true. Those studies yield uh, dates for mitochondrial Eve ranging from 60 to 200,000 years ago. In other words, the conventional range. You could do the same thing for migration events that happened in the more distant past, but are still within the young Earth time frame. So like, for example, the settlement of the Canary Islands and the uh, Pacific Island of Vanuatu, uh, both of those events happened within the last few thousand years we know within a very tight window when they happened, and we know where the migration event came from. So you can compare the mitochondrial DNA of the current inhabitants of those islands with the sister population on the nearby mainland and look at the rate of mitochondrial uh, mutation accumulation in that time frame. And wouldn't you know it, you get the same results. 
But we don't have to stop there. We can give one more reason why Raw Matt is wrong about what he is going to say. Because those single generation pedigrees that he cherry picks, they have another problem. They don't weed out somatic mutations. Somatic mutations are mutations that occur outside of the germline, the reproductive cells. So basically, look at it this way. If you have a parent, right, you can look at this figure here that I made for a video that I made for this channel like five years ago at this point. So if you have a parent, and you have their child, and you compare their DNA, there are three things that could cause their DNA could be different. Basically, there's mutations that can happen in three places that can cause their mutations, uh, their DNA, to have a different sequence. So first, there could be a mutation that occurs in the germline of the parent, which is then inherited by the child. So that's going to show up as a difference between the parent and the child. Right? And that's fine. You can use that when you're calculating the time to most recent common ancestor because those germline mutations can be inherited. But the other two things that can happen is that you can have a somatic mutation in the parent or you can have a somatic mutation in the child. Those are those arrows sticking off to the side there. Both of those events are going to result in a difference when you compare the DNA of the two, but neither of those types of mutations can be inherited by subsequent generations. So when you calculate the per-generation mutation rate, you have to remove somatic mutations from your data set, and in a single generation, you don't. So a pedigree that's based on just parent offspring, and you're just looking at the differences between those two, you're roping in all of those somatic mutations that also show up as differences, even though they can't be inherited and therefore can't contribute to the long-term rate of mutation accumulation. So do those single generation pedigrees that Raw Matt is going to use account for this problem? No, they do not. A few years back, David Neff uh, reached out to the author of the 2015 study that Dr. Nathaniel Jensen uses, uh, Jun Ding. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but I think it's Jun Ding. And uh, it, he was very clear that in the data set that they used, he very clearly, very directly said they did not separate out the somatic from the germline mutations. They didn't distinguish, they just lumped them all together which means the young earth calculations are completely meaningless on those grounds too. You can ignore everything else I said. The fact that they include somatic mutations, that's it. None of this matters. So to review, Raumat is going to say that mitochondrial Eve existed about 6,000 years ago based on directly observed pedigree-based mutation rates. This is wrong because one, that requires zero purifying selection acting on the mitochondrial DNA when we have very strong evidence of very strong purifying selection. Two, directly observed multi-generation pedigree-based mutation rates and rates calculated from migration events with known dates in the past within the Young Earth time frame return a much more distant time for that most recent common ancestor. And finally, three, the paper's raw mat will cite fail on their own terms because they fail to distinguish between somatic and germline mutations and are therefore meaningless in terms of calculating the time to most recent mitochondrial common ancestor. That's why everything you will hear potentially in the future in that video from Raw Matt is wrong. Thank you all for watching. Please remember to do the algorithm friendly activities before you go. Hit the like button, leave a comment, uh, subscribe if you're not subscribed, consider becoming a channel member. I'd appreciate it. And as always, don't get fooled.